Good evening. I'm Bernard Schwartz, the director of the 92nd Street Wise Unterberg Poetry Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's celebration of Derek Walcott. Before the reading begins, I'd like to thank Derek's daughters, Anna and Elizabeth, Sigrid Nama, and also our co-presenters, the Academy of American Poets, Kave Kahnem, Farrar Strauss and Giroux, the Poetry Society of America, and Poets House. Please note that two of the originally scheduled participants, Wendell Manwarn and Yusuf Komenyaka, are not able to join us tonight. Derek Walcott first graced this stage in 1977, and to kick things off, here he is in 2014, the last of his many Poetry Center appearances, reading from the opening of The Schooner Flight. Listen, and together let us snatch his talk from the faint surf's drone through the sea canes. Thank you. The first few lines of this poem are modeled on the lines, the beginning of Piers Plowman in a summer season when soft was the sun. That's the beginning of Piers Plowman. And this one is in idle August while the sea soft. So it was a lovely theft. Um, so the schooner flight. In idle August, while the sea soft and leaves of brown islands stick to the rim of this Caribbean, I blow out the light by the dreamless face of Maria Concepcion to ship as a seaman on the schooner flight. Out in the yard, turning gray in the dawn, I stood like a stone, and nothing else moved but the cold sea, rippling like galvanized, and the nail holes of stars in the sky roof till a wind starts to interfere with the trees. I passed me dry neighbor sweeping she yard as I went downhill, and I nearly said, sweep soft, you bitch, cause she don't sleep hard. But the bitch looked through me like I was dead. A route taxi pull up, park lights still on. The driver sized up my bags with a grin. This time, she been like, you're really gone. I answer the ass. I simply pile in the back seat and watch the sky burn above love and teal, pink as the gown in which the woman I left was sleeping. And I look in the rear view and see a man exactly like me. And the man was weeping for the houses, the streets, that whole fucking island. Oh, good evening. Thank you so much for coming out. And I want to thank, um, oh, by the way, my name is Hilton <laughs> Owls. Um, I want to thank Carol Phillips and Bernard Schwartz for thinking of me in connection with Derek. And I thank Derek's family as well, Sigrid and his daughters, for sharing um, their father and lover with us. This short piece is for Kaz and for Sigrid. Love comes at us from all directions sometimes, and the love I felt in this hall three or four years ago, I can't remember when specifically, grief scrambles time, let alone the heart, is the kind of love that stays with you, works its way into your bones, defies you to forget. Back then, the Y was hosting Derek's last reading in New York, Glenn Maxwell, and Carol Phillips sat with the great poet. They took turns reading the words he had conjured up but could no longer recite, an event further marked by Derek's halting talk and memory, the phosphorescent flashes of strength and wit that at times pushed age and infirmity aside, the better to be seen and sometimes show off. On that evening, when was it, as Derek spoke or had 
one or another of the young writers speak for him, I felt a transformative love fill the hall and fill me, a love for those men together that released me from the hope that Derek could love me more intimately than he could, or should I say, more consistently. Because what I realized watching that enormous and aged lion with his perfect head sitting between the two poets of his soul, young men who stood by him and loved him in ways that did not fail love, was that all the true emotion of Derek's long, varied, complicated, beautiful, immense, stunted, ever-blossoming life I had found long before in the words he could no longer recite, but he had etched in the great rock of the world. Since his death, I can't remember when specifically, remember grief scrambles time and the heart. Many people have claimed Derek in familiar, familial terms, son, uncle, guide, and when I think of my own brief but intense relationship to him, I don't claim him as anyone having to do with my family or a family. He was too good looking for that too independent and cross and brilliant for anything as remote and, as ban and banal as uncle or son. I think what I wanted from him was what one might call a friendly intimacy we could both laugh with, the way he and his great friend and former wife, Margaret, would laugh together, and just hearing her name would make Derek light up and start to chuckle in the way only West Indian men laugh which is from the waist, silently at first, then going up, 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 shaking the shoulders and wetting the eyes before remarking on the remarkable, a human's ability to amuse another human. Derek told me once, when was that? That when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature, he telephoned Margaret to give her the news, and she said, I don't believe you. <laughs> Are you drunk? and then hung up. <laughs> Friendly intimates, that was the dream. It was not an unreasonable one given the milieu I met him in. That would have been in 1975 or 1976. Back then, when was it? I spent a great deal of time with the poet and playwright and above all great teacher Owen Dodson. He had an apartment on West 51st Street. I was not yet 17, Owen was in his 60s, and often when he introduced me with a great Negro queen flourish as his godson, the more cynical in the group would choke back there, can you believe this shit feeling, <laughs> and sigh. We didn't care. Love frees you to feel just that, no matter what. One met the world in Owen's flat, so many stars of color, Ruby Dee, Ozzie Davis, Toni Morrison, Josephine Premis, Diane Carroll, floating, floating. One evening, amidst all those stars, I met a poet named Derek Wolcott. He had just published a book called The Star Apple Kingdom, and shall we just say that to look at Derek back then, dressed in a black turtleneck, that perfect solid head on those perfect solid shoulders, was to be embarrassed by one's own physical self and unremarkable in comparison to everything, except Derek. Derek has written of having Africa in his veins, along with Europe and England, and it was all there on his face and light eyes that long ago starry evening. When was it? And that face was actually the envelope to his poems, which were not post-colonial masterworks, but masterworks ab about, among other things, love in the time of colonization. I woke up to all that several years after we met when the New Yorker published his mid-career poem, Jean Rees, which I'll read to you now. In their faint photographs modeled with chemicals, like the left hand of some spinster ant, they have drifted to the edge of verandas in Whistlerian white. Their jungle turned tea brown, even its spiked palms their features pale to be penciled in, bone-colored gentlemen with spiked mustaches and their wives embayed in the wickerwork, armchairs, all looking colored from the distance 
of a century beginning to groan sideways from the act stroke. Their bay horses blackened like spaniels, the front lawn a beige carpet, brown moonlight and a moon so sallow, so pharmaceutical that her face is a feverish child's, some malarial angel whose grave still cowers under fury of bush, a mania of wild yams wrangling to hide her from ancestral churchyards. And the sigh of that child is white as an orchid on a crusted log in the bush of Dominica, a V of Chinese white meant for the beat of a seagull over a sepia souvenir of Cornwall as the white hush between two sentences. Sundays, their furnace of boredom after church. A maiden aunt canoes through the lilies of clouds in a Carib hammock to a hymn's metronome, and the child on the varnished, lion-footed couch sees the hills dip and straighten with each lurch. The green-leaved uproar of the century turns dim as the Atlantic, a rumorous haze behind the lime trees, breakers advancing in decorous pleated lace, the cement grindstone of the afternoon turns slowly, sharpening her senses. The bay below is green as Kalalu, stewing Saragasso. In that fierce hush between Dominican mountains, the child expects a sound from a butterfly clipping itself to a bush like a gold earring to a black maid's ear, one who goes down to the village visiting whose pink dress wilts like a flower between the limes. There are logs wrinkled like the hand of an old woman who wrote with a fine courtesy to that world when grace was common as malaria, when the gas lanterns hiss on the veranda, drew the ants out like moths, doomed to be pressed in a book, to fall into the brown oblivion of an album, embroiderers of silence. For when the arches of the Thames, Parliament's needles, and the petty point reflections of London Bridge fade on the hammock cushions from the sun, when where one night a child stares at the windless candle flame from the corner of a lion-footed couch at the erect white light, her right hand married to Jane Eyre, foreseeing that her own white wedding dress will be white paper. Derek's lyric is a statement of fact about empathy. You can't be a truly great writer, I don't think, unless you engage in the discipline of imagining someone else's life, how they might feel, what might make them, them. Derek's greatest work is a marriage of his eye, the poet's eye, and the novelist's ability to see society for what it is while imagining what it could be as it, as it affects that eye. I was greatly protected in that world of black stars Owen created, and to leave it skinless was to enter a more confusing universe that had been robbed somehow of the black fraternity I had grown up in. In this new world, there were writers and artists of color who were as venal, self-interested, and mean as the next guy. What, did Derek's work, what Derek's work did for me, at least, was to create or recreate a platonic world of color, the one I had grown up in at Owen's house, where everything broken was intact and perfect, and there were so many stories and one story about a culture born of horror and ability, sometimes down there at the Hotel Normandy Pool, or in Norlene's hair, or in a story that begins with a fairy tale image of a dog before collapsing from love for his daughter, Anna. Rereading Jean Rhys now feels like a presentiment, of course, because Sigrid, his life partner, was to some extent in so-called real life, the figure in that poem about belonging and not belonging, a white person or Creole who found her home in a primarily black world. Once in St. Lucia, when I was writing my profile of Derek for The New Yorker, I went to the mark with, with Sigrid, and the women merchants said cruel things 
Sigrid did not hear or could not hear, did not hear or could not hear, and I thought, I'm with the minority no matter what. <clears throat> and home must be where you put your heart to rest in the heart cave of another. And Derek's love for Sigrid could not have happened had it not understood in great poems like Jean Rhys what it was like to be of something and not of something, an artist all at the same time. I loved Derek's essays. He told me he felt very insecure about the form. But of course his essays are, ma essays are masterly because what are essays but an eye standing in the middle of an experience? He had done that in so many poems. In the Antilles, fragments of epic his memory a fantastic piece from his 1998 collection, What the Twilight Says, there is this description of attending a performance of the Hindu epic Ramlala in Trinidad. Derek writes, the sigh of history rises over ruins, not over landscapes, and in the Antilles there are few ruins to sigh over apart from the ruins of sugar estates and abandoned forts. Looking around slowly as a camel would, Taking in the low blue hills over Port of Spain, the village road and the houses, the warrior archers, the god actors and their handlers, and music already on the soundtrack, I wanted to make a film that would be a long drawn out sigh over Felicity. I was filtering the afternoon with evocations of a lost India, but, what, but why evocations? Why not celebrations of a real presence why should India be lost when none of these villages ever really knew it? And why not continuing? Why not the perpetuation of joy and felicity and in all the other nouns of the central plain, Kuva, Shahangas, Charlie Village? Why was I not letting my pleasure open its windows wide? I was entitled, like any Trinidadian, to the ecstasies of their claim because ecstasy was the pitch of the sinuous drumming in the loudspeakers. Break of, vase, break of vase, and the love that resembles the fragments is stronger than that love which took its symmetry for granted when it was whole. The glue that fits the pieces is the ceiling of its original shape. It is such a love that re reassembles our African and Asiatic fragments, the cracked heirlooms whose restoration shows its white scars. The glue that made Derek whole that long ago evening at the Y, when was it? Was the fraternity of love Glenn and Kaz offered up, a love I had grown up in at Owen's house and missed all the more for them having it, having it on this stage, a white man with soul and men of color in love, looking over fragments all together in love and not alone. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Forche. I'm very grateful to be included this evening and I was very fortunate to have known Derek as a friend. I'm honored to read his work. The first poem is Air from the Gulf and Other Poems. There has been romance, but it has been the romance of pirates and outlaws. The natural graces of life do not show themselves under such conditions. There are no people here in the true sense of the word with a character and purpose of their own. Frood, the bow of Ulysses. The unheard, omnivorous jaws of this rainforest not merely devour all, but allow nothing vain. They never rest, grinding their disavowal of human pain. Long, long before us, those hot jaws, like an oven steaming, were open to genocide. They devoured two minor yellow races and half of a black. In the word made flesh of God, all entered that gross, undiscriminating stomach, 
the forest is unconverted because that shell-like noise which roars like silence or ocean surpliced choirs entering its nave to a censer of swung mist is not the rustling prayer, but nothing, milling air, a faith infested, cannibal, which eats gods, which devoured the god refusing carib, petal by golden petal, then forgot and the Arawak, who leaves not the lightest fern trace of his fossil to be cultured by black rock, but only the rusting cries of a rainbird, like a horse warrior summoning his race from vaporous air between this mountain ridge and the vague sea, where the lost exodus of Corials sunk without trace. There is too much of nothing here. This is chapter 15 from Another Life. The, among the Annas addressed in this poem is Derek's daughter, Anna. Still dreamt of, still missed, especially on raw, rainy mornings, your face shifts into anonymous schoolgirl faces, a punishment since sometimes you condescend to smile, since at the corners of the smile there is forgiveness. Besieged by sisters, you were a prize of which they were too proud, circled by the thorn thicket of their accusation. What grave deep wrong, what wound have you brought, Anna? The rain season comes with its load. The half year has traveled far, its back hurts, it drizzles wearily. It is 20 years since after another war, the shell cases are where? But in our brassy season, our imitation autumn, your hair puts out its fire. Your gaze haunts innumerable photographs. <clears throat> now clear, now indistinct, all that pursuing generality, that vengeful conspiracy with nature, all that sly informing of objects, and behind every line, your laugh frozen into a lifeless photograph. In that hair, I could walk through the wheat fields of Russia. Your arms were downed and ripening pears, for you became, in fact, another country. You are Anna of the wheat field and the weir. You are Anna of the solid winter rain, Anna of the smoky platform and the cold train. In that war of absence, Anna of the steaming stations. Gone from the marsh edge, from the drizzled shallows, puckering with goose flesh, Anna of the first green poems that startlingly hardened of the mellowing breasts now. Anna of the lurching, long flamingos of the harsh salt lingering in the thimble of the bather's smile, Anna of the darkened house, among the reeking shell cases, lifting my hand and swearing us to her breast, unbearably clear-eyed. You are all Annas, enduring all goodbyes within the cynical station of your body. Christy, Karenina, big-boned and passive. That I found life within some novel's leaves, more real than you, already chosen as his doomed heroine. You knew. You knew. Who were you then? The golden partisan of my young revolution my braided, practical, seasoned commissar. 
your back bent at its tasks in the blue kitchen, or hanging flags of laundry, feeding the farm's chickens against a fantasy of birches, poplars, or whatever. As if a pen's eye could catch that virginal litheness, as if shade and sunlight leoparding the blank page could be so literal, foreign as snow. Far away as first love, my Akmatova. Twenty years later, in the odor of burnt shells, you remind me of a visit to the Pasternak's, so that you are suddenly the word wheat, falling on the ear, frozen against the silence of a weir. Again, you are bending over the cabbage garden, tending a snowdrift of rabbits, or pulling down the clouds from the thrumming clotheslines. If dreams are signs, then something died this minute, its breath blown from a different life, from a dream of snow, from paper to white paper flying, gulls and herons following this plow, and now you are suddenly old, white-haired, like the herons, the turned page. Anna, I wake to the knowledge that things sunder from themselves like peeling bark to the emptiness of a bright silence shining after thunder. Any island would drive you crazy. I knew you'd grow tired of all that iconography of the sea, like the young wind, a bride riffling day long, the ocean's catalog of shells and algae, everything. This flock of white novitiate herons I saw in the grass of a gray parish church like nurses or young nuns after communion. Their sharp eyes sought me out as yours once only. And you were heron-like, a water haunter. You grew bored with your island till finally you took off without a cry, a novice in your nurse's uniform. Years later, I imagined you walking through trees to some gray hospital, serene communicant but never lonely, like the wind, never to be married. Your faith, like folded linen, a nun's, a nurse's. Why should you read this now? No woman should read verses 20 years late. You go about your calling, candle-like, carrying yourself down a dark aisle of wounded, married to the sick, knowing one husband, pain, only with the heron flock, the rain, the stone church I remembered. Besides the slender virginal New Year's, just married like a birch to a few crystal tears, and like a birch bent at the register who cannot for a light's flash change her name, she still writes 65 for 66. So watching the tacit ministering herons, each at its work among the dead, the stone church, the stones. I made this in your honor, when vows and affections failing your soul leapt like a heron sailing from the salt island grass into another heaven. Anna replies, I am simple. I was simpler then. It was simplicity which seemed so sensual. What could I understand? The world, the light. The light in the mud-stained sea wash. The light in a gull's creek letting the night in. They were simple to me. I was not within them as simply as I was within you. It was your selflessness which loved me as the world. I was a child, as much as you, but you brought the tears of too many contradictions. I became a metaphor, but believe me, I was unsubtle as salt. And I answer, Anna, 
20 years after, a man lives half of life. The second half is memory. The first half, hesitation for what should have happened but could not, or what happened with others when it should not. A gleam, her burning grip, the brass shell cases oxidized, the brass reeking of cordite 41 years after the Great War. The gleam of brass reburnished in the Alamanda through the barbed wire of bougainvillea thorns. Beyond the window on the sun chevroned porch, I watched the far cannon smoke of cloud above the morn, wounded, struck dumb as she drew my hand firmly to the firstness of the crisp, fragile cloth across her breast. In a locked silence, she the nurse. I, the maimed soldier. There have been other silences, none as deep. There has since been possession, none as sure. I close with the poem, Sea Grapes. The sail which leans on light, tired of islands, a schooner beating up the Caribbean for home, could be Odysseus, homebound on the Aegean, that father and husband's longing under gnarled sour grapes is like the adulterer hearing Nausicaa's name in every gull's outcry. This brings nobody peace. The ancient war between obsession and responsibility will never finish and has been the same for the sea wanderer or the one on the shore now wriggling on his sandals to walk home since Troy sighed its last flame and the blind giant's boulder heaved the trough from whose ground swell the great hexameters come in the conclusions of exhausted surf. The classics can console but not enough. I first met Derek Walcott about 30 years ago, and I worked with him on several projects. These included first staged readings of Seamus Heaney's The Cure at Troy, and Derek's own The Odyssey, a stage version here at the 92nd Street Y during the years I was director of the Poetry Center, and a performance of Derek's late verse play, Moonchild, Tijon in Concert at the American Academy in Rome. Derek's rough humor was familiar to all who knew him, but so was his huge personal loyalty. Such loyalty made possible appearances in venues, including this one, that never paid him anything close to what he could have commanded on the lecture circuit. I remember arriving with him at our modest suburban house in Pennsylvania after Derek had read at Bryn Mawr College. As we pulled up in the car, Derek exclaimed to his partner, Sigrid, look what Carl did with all the money he made ripping off writers at the Y for all those years. <laughs> the rough humor took some getting used to, but one sensed with Derek that underneath it, there was in fact a personal shyness and a tenderness. I was never Derek's student in any formal sense, and I joined the faculty at Boston University seven years after he had retired. But of how many contemporary poets working in English can we say that they had a truly epic vision and ambition? This is what I so valued in Derek's work. This and his poetic line sponsored by Shakespeare in the Bible, as Seamus Heaney once said. Derek 
also showed a kind of authentic piety in the presence of great poetry that was as much an inspiration to those around him as was his own work. I'd like to start with the first section of Cul-de-Sac Valley and Ars Poetica from Derek's 1987 book, Arkansas Testament. A panel of sunrise on a hillside shop gave these stanzas their stilted shape. If my craft is blessed, if this hand is as accurate, as honest as their carpenters, every frame intent on its angles would echo this settlement of unpainted wood as consonants scroll off my shaving plain in the fragrant creole of their native grain. From a trestle bench, they'd curl at my foot, seize ours with a French or West African root. From a dialect thronging, its leaves unread, yet light on the tongue of their native road. But dragging towards my pegged out twine with beveled boards of unpainted pine, like muttering shale, exhaling trees, refresh memory with their smell, bois canot, bois compeche, hissing what you wish from us will never be. Your words is English, is a different tree. The poem makes clear, I think, exactly how much a geographical place can give a poet as language. But in a section of Derek's 2004 book, The Prodigal, we hear his ambivalence about leaving the island of his birth for the wider world. There was a vow I made rigid apprentice to the horizontal sunrise, acolyte to the shallows imprecations, to the odor of earth turned by the rain, to the censer of mist, to the penance of cocoa, though I hated its darkness, to the wrist of a cold spring between black rocks, and any road that lost its mind in the mountains to the freight train of the millipede, to the dragonfly's biplane, to the eel's submarine, as the natural powers I knew, swearing not to leave them for real principalities in Berlin or Milan. But my craft's irony was in betrayal. It widened reputation and shrank the archipelago to stepping stones, oceans to puddles. It made that vow provincial and predictable in the light of a silver drizzle in, say, Pescara. Next, the prologue to Derek's The Odyssey, a stage version of 1993, spoken by the bard called Blind Billy Blue, and incorporating a line of Homer in Greek. Derek read this himself when the play was given its New York premiere on this stage. Sound of Surf. I'm gonna sing about that man because his stories please us who saw trials and tempests for 10 years after Troy. I'm blind Billy Blue, my main man, sea smart Odysseus who the god of the sea drove crazy and tried to destroy. Andra moyanepe musa polutropon nos mala pala. The shuttle of the sea moves back and forth on this line. All night, like the surf, she shuttles and doesn't fall asleep. Then her rosy fingers at dawn unstitch the design. When you hear this chord, Look for a swallow's wings, a swallow arrowing seaward like a messenger, passing smoke blue islands, happy that the kings of Troy are going home and its 10 years siege is over. So my blues drifts like smoke from the fire of that war. Cause once Achilles was ashes, things sure fell apart. Slow striding Achilles, who put the hex on Hector. A swallow twitters in Troy. 
That's where we start. Derek's life encompassed both the proper colonial education he received when he was young, I think that phrase is Wole Shoyinka's, and the dismantling of the very empire that provided that education, as in this poem, passage from a poem in Derek's 2010 book, White Egrets, The Lost Empire. And then there was no more empire all of a sudden. Its victories were air, its dominions dirt. Burma, Canada, Egypt, Africa, India, the Sudan. The map that had seeped its stain on a schoolboy's shirt like red ink on a blotter, battles, long sieges, dows and feluccas, hill stations, outposts, flags fluttering down in the dusk, their golden aegis went out with the sun, the last gleam on a great crag, the tiger-eyed, turbaned Sikhs, pennons of the Raj to a sobbing bugle. I see it all come about again, the tasseled cortege, the clop of the tossing team with funeral pom-poms, the sergeant major's shout, the stamp of boots, then the volley. There is no greater theme than this chasm deep surrendering of power, the whited eyes and robes of surrendering hordes, red tunics and the great names, Sindh, Turkestan, Kanpur, dust dervishes, and the Saharan silence afterwards. In some senses, Derek never moved too far imaginatively from St. Lucia and its landscapes provided a backdrop also for his meditations on advancing age. I'll close with this extraordinary long line sonnet from his book, The Bounty of 1997. Never get used to this, the feathery swaying casuarinas the morning silent light on shafts of bright grass, the growling aves of the ocean, the white lances of the marinas, surf fingering its beads, hail heron and gull full of grace. Since that is all you need to do now at your age and its coming serene extinction, like the light on the shale at sunset and your gift fading out of this page. Your soul traveled the one horizon like a quiet snail, infinity behind it, infinity ahead of it, and all that it knew was this craft, all that it wanted. What did it know of death? Only what you had read of it, that it was like a flame blown out in a lowered lantern, a night, but Without these stars, the prickle of planets, lights like a vast harbor or devouring oblivion. Never get used to this, the great moon on these studded nights that make the heart stagger and the stirring lion of the headland. This is why you have ended, to pass praising the feathery swaying of the casuarinas and those shuddering of th shudderings of thanks that so often descended the evening light in the shafts of feathery grass, the lances fading, then the lights of the marinas, the yachts studying their reflections in black glass. My name is Elizabeth Alexander. Before he was my teacher, his poems were my teacher. I read selections from Another Life in the New York Review of Books outside of the classroom in college, and thus they were mine alone, my discovery. 
I did not call myself a poet then. I wrote English class essays, then I wrote short stories, then I graduated and wrote for a newspaper. But I kept those poems in their little boxes cut out from the New York Review of Books with me and close and ended up going to Boston to study with Derek. I had no poems then. I presented myself uh, at, uh, in Derek's office. Uh, I had been admitted to write fiction and I said I had come to Boston to study with him. Where are your poems, he said. I have no poems, I said. <laughs> so I opened up what I had brought with me, my diary, my actual diary. It did not have a lock and key, but it was a dear diary diary, and I gave it to him, and I said, well, have a look. And he went through the diary. He looked, he looked, he looked, he looked, he looked, and then he took a piece of legal paper, and he copied out something I had written, and he lineated it. He put line breaks, slashes for line breaks. And he said, well, see, what you're doing is writing poems, but you just don't understand what a line is. Poems are made of lines, he said. <laughs> you must break the line. Oh, OK, I said, so go off and write some poems and don't come back until you have a bunch of them to show me. And so I did. And that was that. He taught me the relationship between the poem's line and the water line. The surf comes in, the surf comes out, the breath comes in, the breath comes out. The foamy line the surf leaves behind is the line of verse, and then it is erased, and every day we start over again. I think it is so lucky to be black. I think blackness is mighty, exquisite, endowed. Derek found all of that sentimental. Don't bring me your black girl poems, he said. <laughs> Which was, uh, was, it was sentimental. Um, I am sentimental about being black uh, and a black girl. Um, but I think what is so interesting is that a fact, a matter of fact undergirding his poems is complex, multitudinous, infinitely possible blackness. Derek taught me like family, like my family, the Jamaicans, the Alabamans, and the Harlemites. And this is how unsentimental, exacting, rigorous, never coddling, never cheerleading, know what a pretty girl, listen, sit, I don't like to repeat myself, uh, and matter-of-factly expecting excellence. He called forth for me what it means to be a scattered part of this chain of repeating islands, including Manhattan, each with its own particularity. We are scattered, but somehow we find each other and say, yes, I know that old man. I know his hat. I know what he drinks. I know how he whistles. I know how he laughs. I know what shifts him from gruffness to tender. I know what makes him cry. In the light of the world, my favorite of Derek's poems, what brings the aging male speaker to tears is the honesty of where he is accepted and loved after he has gone, in Derek's word, elsewhere. He belongs to some place. That you can leave a place, leave people, and they will forever have you back. It is a lucky person who belongs as Derek belonged. This thing I am is a poet. What do you say about the person who told you who you are, who saw the self that was there so plainly before you saw it yourself? You are a poet. Now go write some poems. I loved Derek so very, very much. Sea canes. Half my friends are dead. I will make you new ones, said Earth. No, give, them back, give me them back as they were. Instead, with faults and all, I cried. Tonight, I can snatch their talk from the faint surf's drone through the canes. But I cannot walk on the moonlit leaves of ocean down that white road alone or float with the dreaming motion of owls leaving Earth's load. Oh, Earth, the number of friends you keep exceeds those left to be loved. The sea canes by the cliff flash green and silver. They were the seraph lances of my faith. 
but out of what is lost grows something stronger that has the rational radiance of stone, enduring moonlight, further than despair, strong as the wind, that through dividing canes brings those we love before us as they were, with faults and all, not nobler, just there. St. Lucia's First Communion. Uh, and this poem ends with one of Derek's few exclamation points. Uh, and, uh, but it's not an exclamation point used in a way that you w might accept for joy or for exaltation, um, but rather for the awesomeness of horror. St. Lucia's First Communion. At dusk on the edge of the asphalt's worn out ribbon in white cotton frock, cotton stockings, a black child stands. First her, then a small field of her. Ah, it's First Communion. They hold pink ribboned missiles in their hands, the stiff plaits pinned with their white satin moths. The caterpillar's accordion still pumping out the myth along twigs of cotton from whose parted mouths the wafer pods in belief without and if. So all across St. Lucia, thousands of innocents were arranged on church steps, facing the sun's lens, erect as candles between squinting parents, before darkness came on like their blinded saints. But if it were possible to pull up on the verge of the dimming asphalt, before its headlights lance their eyes, to house each child in my hands, to lower the window a crack, and delicately urge the last moth delicately in. I'd let the dark car enclose their blizzard, and on some black hill, their pulsing wings undusted, loose them in thousands to stagger heavenward before it came on. The prejudice, the evil. Tomorrow, tomorrow. I remember the cities I have never seen exactly. Silver-veined Venice, Leningrad with its toffee-twisted minarets, Paris. Soon the Impressionists will be making sunshine out of shade. Oh, and the uncoiling cobra alleys of Hyderabad. Hyderabad. To have loved one horizon is insularity. It blindfolds vision, it narrows experience. The spirit is willing, but the mind is dirty. The flesh wastes itself under crumbs sprinkled linens, widening the Weltanschauung with magazines. A world's outside by the door, but how upsetting to stand by your bags on a cold step as dawn roses the brickwork and before you start regretting. Your taxi's coming with one beep of its horn, sidling to the curb like a hearse. So you get in. and uh, to end the season of phantasmal peace. Then all the nations of birds lifted together the huge net of the shadows of this earth in multitudinous dialects, twittering tongues, stitching and crossing it. They lifted up the shadows of long pines down trackless slopes, the shadows of glass-faced towers down evening streets, the shadow of a frail plant on a city sill, the net rising soundless at night, the birds' cries soundless until there was no longer dusk or season, decline or weather, only this passage of phantasmal light that not the narrowest shadow dared to sever. And men could not see, looking up, what the wild geese drew, what the ospreys trailed behind them in silvery ropes that flashed in the icy sunlight. They could not hear battalions of starlings waging peaceful cries, bearing the net higher, covering this world like the vines of an orchard, or a mother drawing the trembling gauze over the trembling eyes of a child fluttering to sleep. It was the light that you will see at evening on the side of a hill in yellow October, and no one hearing knew what change had brought into the raven's cawing, the kill deer's screech, the ember circling chuff, such an immense, soundless, and high concern for the fields and cities where the birds belong, except it was their seasonal passing. Love made seasonless, 
or from the high privilege of their birth, something brighter than pity for the wingless ones below them who shared dark holes in windows and in houses, and higher they lifted the net with soundless voices, above all change, betrayals of falling suns, and this season lasted one moment, like the pause between dusk and darkness, between fury and peace, but for such as our earth is now, it lasted long. I'm Robert Antoni. Love after love. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, Sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. This is the final section, final stanza of the schooner flight after the storm. There's a fresh light that follows a storm while the whole sea still havoc. In its bright wake, I saw the veiled face of Maria Concepcion marrying the ocean, then drifting away in the widening lace of her, burial of her bridal train with white gulls, her bridesmaids, till she was gone. I wanted nothing after that day. Across my own face, like the face of the sun, a light rain was falling with the sea calm. Fall gently, rain, on the sea's upturned face like a girl showering. Make these islands fresh as Shabin once knew them. Let every trace, every hot road, smell like clothes she just press and sprinkle with drizzle. I finished dream. Whatever the rain wash and the sun iron, the white clouds, the sea and sky with one seam, is close enough for my nakedness. Though my flight never passed the incoming tide of this, inland, of this inland sea beyond the loud reefs of the final Bahamas, I am satisfied if my hand give voice to one people's grief. Open the map. More islands there man than peas on a tin plate, all different size, 1,000 in the Bahamas alone, from mountains to low scrub with coral keys. And from this bowsprit, I bless every town. The blue smell of smoke in the hills behind them and the one small road winding down them like twine to the roofs below. I have only one theme, the bowsprit, the arrow, the longing, the lunging heart, 
the flight to a target whose aim we'll never know. Vain search for one island that heals with its harbor and a guiltless horizon, where the almond's shadow doesn't injure the sand. There are so many islands, as many islands as stars at night, on that branched tree from which meteors are shaken like falling fruit around the schooner flight. But things must fall, and so it always was. On one hand, Venus, on the other, Mars, fall and are one, just as the Earth is one island in archipelagos of stars. My first friend was the sea, now is my last. I stop talking now. I work, then I read, cutching under a lantern hooked to the mast. I try to forget what happiness was, and when that don't work, I study the stars. Sometimes it's just me and the soft scissored foam as the deck turn white and the moon open a cloud like a door, and the light over me is a road in white moonlight taking me home. Shabin sang to you from the depths of the sea. Pastora Divina, Holy Shepherdess, let my heart find that peace that leaves emotion far behind. Let my mind lie in that sea green valley with no motion but the wind. I am a driven gull seeking those seas past restlessness where every rolling hill is like a wave that stayed still by the hand of grace. O Divina Pastora, Holy Shepherdess. Thus spoke our Derek, and the Divina Pastora came when he had run his course and was full of days and led the poet into that sea green space where he is no doubt playing peacock with his family, friends, and loved ones many of whom he'd been missing for decades, wanting them back as they were, faults and all. So now he's with them, and boy, do we miss him. I know I do. I've known Derek for over 50 years. He and Margaret were good friends with my sister Barbara and her husband, Ansel Glodon, and Ansel and Derek were part of the group of golden lads and girls who were the first to graduate from the University of the West Indies. They were the region's best and brightest, and many of them were extraordinarily talented, gifted, creative, pe creative people, but they all conceded that Derek was a genius. Others came trailing clouds of glory but he had a sure appointment with greatness. And I owe him because he read some of my early poems and told me that I was a poet. And I knew I could believe him because he was consistently stern and uncompromising when it came to judging poetry. There are two things about Derek that I just want to say. One is that in all the years I've known him, I never once saw him dance. <laughs> never, never once saw him dance. And um, I'm sure he probably danced at home with his beloved Sigrid. Sigrid, he danced with you, right? Okay. But um, I never saw him dance. And I always wondered why this was so. 
And in the 1970s, when the Trinidad, Trinidad Theatre Company would tour the islands with their world-class productions, like the peerless Dream on Monkey Mountain, Tija and his brothers, and the Joke of Seville, many a fete would follow the night's performance. Fets where some dedicated, serious dancing was done, but not by Derek. <laughs> and I once asked his friend, the magnificent actor Albert Laveau, and I also asked Errol Jones and Stanley Marshall, I said, why, why does he not dance? <laughs> and I got the 3D response, it, Derek don't dance. <laughs> I accepted that this may be the reason why he once wrote, someone must write your poems. That's why he didn't dance. But over the years, I have come to the conclusion that his stationary stance was part of his divine assignment as our watchman. For Derek watched over us. Boy, did our day watch over us with those deep and prescient eyes. He watched over us, making sure that we did not lime away our gifts. All the Caribbean people in here understand that. <laughs> he taught us that excellence and mastery requires endless hard graft waking early as he did every single day of life to create whole worlds on that juggernaut of a manual Olivetti typewriter. He knew that you had to be, as my husband Ted Chamberlain, who was a good friend to Derek said, he knew he had to be watchful and to keep your covenant with wonder. And the other thing I want to say about my dear friend who taught me much of what I know about poetry and many things about this life. He was a wonderful giver of advice, some of the best advice I've ever received in my life. I received from Derek. But the next thing I want to say about him is that he was so funny. <laughs> Hands up all who miss his big old roar of a laugh. <laughs> he loved to laugh and he loved to make us laugh and his jokes, oh, those jokes. Like the one that cannot be told here <laughs> about the Pope, not this one, two before him. The Pope driving down 125th Street. And I will tell you about it afterwards, if you want. <laughs> but I'm thinking here that maybe I did one seem sort of dance. And it was one night at a party in Kingston at his friends Ralph and Doreen Thompson's house and Derek was over in a corner holding a seminar, a group discussion about the folk songs, or rather the folk song of Barbados because this group of Jamaicans and Trinidadians had come to the conclusion that there was one folk song in Barbados. <laughs> and this song went something like this. Very early one morning, Lord Nelson came down and he shook his left foot so, and he shook his left foot so. And Derek, very solemnly, stood up and shook his left foot. <laughs> and I guess that will have to do for a dance from the best poet ever. <laughs> oh, little red bird in your cage of ribs, tremble, tremble and wait. And he will come now. The sky has no gate. The open air is your temple. Every heart has a right to its freedom. Every heart has a right to its freedom. Thank you. two poems, um, one from early in Derek's career and a late poem. Uh, first of all, a letter from Brooklyn. An old lady 
writes me in a spidery style, each character trembling, and I see a veined hand, pellucid as paper, traveling on a skein of such frail thoughts, its thread is often broken. Or else the filament from which a phrase is hung dims to my sense, but caught, it shines like steel, as touch a line, and the whole web will feel. She describes my father, yet I forget her face more easily than my father's yearly dying. Of her, I remember small buttoned boots and the place she kept in our wooden church on those Sundays whenever her strength allowed, gray-haired, thin-voiced, perpetually bowed. I am Mabel Rawlings, she writes, and know both your parents. He is dead, Miss Rawlings but God bless your tents. Your father was a dutiful, honest, faithful, and useful person. For such plain praise, what is fame recompense? A horn painter, your father painted delicately on horn. He used to sit around the table and paint pictures the peace of God needs nothing to adorn it, nor glory, nor ambition. He is 28 years buried, she writes. He was called home and is, I am sure, doing greater work. The strength of one frail hand in a dim room somewhere in Brooklyn, patient and assured restores my sacred duty to the word. Home, home, she can write, with sh such short time to live alone as she spins the blessings of her years, not withered of beauty if she can bring such tears, nor withdrawn from the world that breaks its lovers so. Heaven is to her the place where painters go. All who bring beauty on frail shell or horn, there was all made, thence their lux mundi drawn, 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 till the thread is resilient steel, lost, though it seems in darkening periods and there they return to do work that is God's. So this old lady writes, and again, I believe, I believe it all, and for no man's death I grieve. In Derek's last collection, White Egrets, he wrote, many, many remarkable poems. This is my favorite. There's a reference to two individuals in the poem. One is Rufus Collins, who was a theater director, an American theater director who died in the Netherlands in 1996. Um, and the other person is Alex Martin, who was Derek's mother in Amsterdam. The cruise boats keep gliding along the brown canal as quiet as prayer. The leaves are packed with peace. The elegant house fronts, repetitive and banal as the hotel brochure, are still as an altarpiece. We cruised it with Rufus Collins once, a white macaw 
on his piratical shoulder, Rufus is gone. Canal spread reflection with calm at the core. I reflect quietly on how soon I will be going. I want the year 2009 to be as angled with light as a Dutch interior or an alley by Vermeer. To accept my enemies a tribulous spite to paint and write well in what could be my last year. Silly to think of a heritage when there isn't much. Though my mother, whose surname was Marlin or Van der Mont, took pride in an ancestry she claimed was Dutch. Now here in Amsterdam, her claim starts to mount. Legitimate, illegitimate, I want to repaint those rubicant Flemish faces, even if it's been done by Franz Hals, by Rubens, by Rembrandt, the clear gray eyes of René, the tree shade on this side, the chestnuts that glitter from the breakfast window. Why should I not claim them as fervently as the pride of Alex Martin? an early widow as a creek in the Congo, if her joy was such. I feel something ending here and something begun. The strong, the light strong leaves, the water muttering in Dutch, the girls going by on bicycles in the sun. Good evening. Oh, my name is Jamaica Kincaid, and uh, I um, come from the same area of the world uh, as Derek. Um, though I want to say um, to Derek's daughters uh, and to Sigrid. Uh, um, I come from Antigua. Derek came from, Derek was from St. Lucia, and my mother was from Dominica. St. Lucia and Dominica were French possessions until 18 something in uh, a treaty between Fran France and uh, Britain. They changed hands and became uh, English. but. Um, these two islands um, seem, are very French and speak uh, Creole, have very French ways. But the, the thing uh, that strikes me now, um, or for a long time, is the idea of the place I'm from changed hands, just changed hands. And uh, it changed hands in um, something that we didn't even really know about. Uh, but from, from that sentence, uh, we changed hands, which implies that we were um, a commodity of some kind and, and without meaning. And that's one way we could look at it. But Derek um, uh, showed us, or showed me in any case, that um, the changing of hands belonged to them, but we were, we in these islands were always uh, ourselves and were unchangeable. And the great thing, very deep and great thing he did 
uh, for us as writers was to give us a homeland, not just in the islands of the Caribbean, or as we say, we, the Anglophone West Indian will say, the West Indies, and that has a whole history. Uh, the language of that has a whole history. But he made us see that our homeland was the entire world, that there was nothing in the world, uh, whether it be the ancient world, the uh, not so ancient world, the contemporary world, everything was ours to use uh, in language, in literature, uh, everything was ours to remake into something holy if we worked at it. Uh, and for that, I'm very grateful to him. When I was a child, I used to be, and still am actually, terrified and find death mis mysterious. And I believe I once said, I, believe, I know this, I said to my mother, um, that uh, people where we lived were dying, so perhaps we could move somewhere else where people uh, didn't die. And, and she looked at me um, with what I now understand to be real pity, because <laughs> pity, it turns out, is a form of love. And she said, people die everywhere, it's just that you don't hear of it. Um, so then I began to think that, well, if uh, people were going to die, perhaps they could move to somewhere where I could just imagine they were alive, but I just didn't hear from them. For instance, if they went to New Zealand. I never heard from anyone in New Zealand. Um, and so wherever, uh, the sadness of this is that um, it's, it's possible that Derek is in New Zealand and, and he doesn't let us know. The light of the world, which is what Derek is to a lot of us, the light of the world. It begins with a quote from a song by Bob Marley. Kaya now, got to have Kaya now, got to have Kaya now for the rain is falling. Marley was rocking on the transport stereo and the beauty was humming the choruses quietly. I could see where the lights on the planes of her cheek streaked and defined them. If this were a portrait, you'd leave the highlights for the last. These lights silkened her black skin. I'd have put in an airing, something simple, in good gold for contrast, but she wore no jewelry. I imagined a powerful and sweet odor coming from her as from a still panther, and the head was nothing else but heraldic. When she looked at me, then away from me politely because any staring at strangers is impolite, it was like a statue, like a black Delacroix, liberty leading the people. The gently bulging whites of her eyes, the carved ebony mouth, the heft of the torso solid, and a woman's, but gradually even that was going in the dusk, except the line of her profile and the high-lit cheek, and I thought, oh beauty, you are the light of the world. It was not the only time I would think of that phrase in the 16-seater transport that hummed between Gross Elect and the market, 
with its grit of charcoal and the litter of vegetables after Sunday's sales and the roaring ram shops outside whose bright doors you saw drunk women on pavements. The saddest of all things, winding up their week, winding down their week. The market, as it closed on this Saturday night, remembered a childhood of wandering gas lanterns hung on poles at street corners and the odd roar of vendors and traffic when the lamplighter climbed, hooked the lantern on its pole and moved on to another and the children turned their faces to its moth their eyes white as their nighties. The market itself was closed in its involved darkness and the shadows quarreled for bread in the shops and, or quarreled for the formal custom of quarreling in the electric rum shops. I remember the shadows. The van was slowly filling in the darkened depot. I sat in the front seat. I had no need for time. I looked at two girls, one in a yellow bodice and yellow shorts with a flower in her hair and lusted in peace. The other less interesting. That evening, I had walked the streets of the town where I was born and grew up thinking of my mother with her white hair tinted by the dying dusk and the tilting box houses that seemed perverse in their camp, in their cramps, in their cramp. I had peered in, on, into parlors with half-closed jealousies at the dim furniture, Morris chairs, a center table with wax flowers and the lithograph of Christ of the Sacred Heart Vendors still selling to the empty streets, sweets, nuts, sodden chocolates, nut cakes, mints. Thank you. An old woman with a straw hat over her headkerchief hobbled towards, out, towards us with a basket. Somewhere some distance off was a heavier basket that she couldn't carry. She was in a panic. She said to the, to the driver, par quittez moi et forgive my pronunciation, which is in her patois, don't leave me stranded, which is in her history and that of her people, don't leave me on earth, or by a shift of stress, don't leave me the earth, for an inheritance, for an inheritance. Per quites mo et ta, heavenly transport. Don't leave me on earth, I've had enough of it. The bus filled in the dark with heavy shadows that would not be left on earth. No, that would be left on the earth and would have to make out. Abandonment was something they had grown used to. And I had abandoned them. I knew that there, sitting in the transport in the sea quiet dusk, with men hunched in canoes and the orange lights from the Vigi he headland, black boats on the water, I, who could never solidify my shadow to be one of their shadows, had left them their earth, their white rum quarrels, and their coal bags, their hatred of corporals, of all authority. I was deeply in love with the woman, with the woman by the window. I wanted to be going home with her this evening. I wanted her to have the key to our small house by the beach at Grothile. I wanted her to change into a smooth white nighty that would pour like water over the black rocks of her breasts, to lie simply beside her by the ring of a brass lamp with a kerosene wick and tell her in silence that her hair was like a hill forest at night, that a trickle of rivers was in her armpits, that I would buy her Benin if she wanted it and never leave her on earth, but the others too. 
because I felt a great love that could bring me tears and a pity that prickled my eyes like a nettle. I was afraid I might suddenly start sobbing on the public transport with the Mali going and a small boy peering over the shoulders uh, of the driver and me at the lights coming at the rush of the road in the country darkness with lamps in the houses on the small hills and thickets of stars. I had abandoned them, I had left them on earth, I had left them to sing Marley's songs of a sadness as real as the smell of rain on dry earth or the smell of damp sand, and the bus felt warm with their neighborliness, their consideration, and the polite partings in the light of the, its headlamps. In the blare, in the thuds, sobbing music, the claiming scent that came from their bodies, I wanted the transport to continue forever, for no one to descend and say a good night in the beams of the lamps and take the crooked path up to the lit door, guided by fireflies. I wanted her beauty to come into the warmth of considerate wood, to the relieved rattling of enamel plates in the kitchen and the tree in the yard, but I came to my stop. Outside the Halcyon Hotel, the lounge would be full of transients like myself, then I would walk with the surf up the beach. I got off the van without saying good night. Good night would be full of an inexpressible love. They went on in their transport. They left me on earth. Then a few yards ahead, the van stopped. A man shouted my name from the transport window. I walked up towards him. He held out something. A pack of cigarettes had dropped from my pocket. He gave it to me. I turned, hiding my tears. There was nothing they wanted, nothing I could give them, but this thing I have called the light of the world. Thank you. This is a poem Derek wrote quite young, I think roughly the age I was when I met him in the late 80s in Boston University. Kingston Nocturne. The peanut barrows whistle and the ladies with perfumes and prophylactics included in the expenses hiss in a minor key the desperate think of rooms with white utensils. Walking near parks where the trees wearing white socks shake over the illicit liaison under the leaves, silent on the heraldic sky, the statue grieves that the locks have still to be tested and stores shut up their eyes at the beggars and hoodlums when the skin breaks from the city and the owls and maggots and lice strike alight the old hates. The wrath of God flames like a neon sign on railings. They scatter their cargo of sleepless fleas. The nightclubs wink like sin. Money hushes, heals all disease. By lantern light, the poker mania of the second coming, when the Lord says him going to take us by the hand, or in antiphony, a calypso wafts from the pubs, and Ulysses again postpones Penelope. The theatres are wounded with midnight, and the limp of the innocent and guilty pour from their sides. The housewife, the young loves, the soldier, the nymphomaniac in their tides. And always to the alone, the stone villages with the prosaic essay on facades wink out their yellow welcomes one by one. And down the dog-forsaken boulevards, the Arab mosaic of stars, the morse of doom, point some to a wife-warm bed or the arms of lice kneeling to the shout in the street, and sleep's equation lays the black down with the white, and death at half the price suggests her house. Uh, 
Um, and I'm now the age he was when I met him in 1987 at Boston University. So I'm reading this new poem for him, not because it's a memorial event and I needed to write it, but also because he was my teacher and he'd want to hear it. He always wanted to hear what I was up to. And, uh, you know, I, I, however old I got, I was always 24 around him because <laughs> that's how we'd met. And uh, I, he could always make my confidence crumble completely. <laughs> but uh, this poem is really about a teacher and a student and um, the impact of Derek Walcott in my life has all been about a teacher and a student. <coughs> I'm off the phone with Boston and it seems I'm going. I shall tell them in a moment. And I can't wait to tell them, though your name's unknown to them and new to me. I open the door to where they're reading in their living room in summer in the 80s, new stanza. Afternoon, the every man of light is turning helpless hour by hour, retiring to his den. Now the call to you, sir, now it's fruitless. My bone white hand is falling toward the blank account book to leaf through in the embers of a Sunday. Nothing written yet and the clock points. My reading lamp reflects on the black window itself alone. No lawn or neighbor's fence, no trees or distant bedroom glow to tilt the mind. My empty page is a suburban silence, earnest, available, where nothing goes at night. Here too, there are so many islands, mon professeur, and silence, I suppose, was pretty much the sound I made in our one-to-ones. Your empty page was ocean, is still ocean, lapping the ribs of this. If it's a blank page anything like mine, it sees no reason to think you won't be back, mistakes the hush for inhalation, waits ecstatically for more. If it's a blank page anything like mine, it never learns but trembles like a dog bound to adore the self-same meal again with all its guts. It dreams a dream of work that never feels like work or ever thinks it's dream. It isn't coming in, the light, the heat. The handle's not about to turn this scene to us lot sitting where we used to sit, our ballpoints circling what we think you mean, our notebooks gaping wide of a Monday morning. And I won't spill the secret. I've no heart to tell a single sheet. There's nothing out there building to a height. No glimpse or thought assembling. Nothing shattering to the shore to be enough for you or be enough for now. Perpetually they wait between the waves, clear pages yet to come. Each one assumes the turn is coming soon. Each one believes itself the first, like me in that bright room in Boston seen clean through, man alone with mentor, turned what days are for. But nothing turns now and nothing breaks. Your own blank page was ocean, is still ocean going on. And mine is nothing dining on the edge of everything. You're there, the fixed important jaw, at the end of a long table, you who were, pestered by some spectral fans, too shy to say they've heard your joke. I haven't, sir. Let's hear it. Look, there's nothing of the kind there at all, but all I do in verse these days is scry the empty page for signs enough. Love and delight rear up in cliffs and caverns, forms from Hubble light my heart and home life, but on the page, Glynn and the scrolling heavens, sod all else for story hereabouts. So help me, for I knew you for a spell, and now you're not. And my worn hands still guided like it was when I was slick. 
There is a breath in earshot which isn't always mine. The wince is yours when the line breaks wrong. The groan when I reckon something's finished. I reckon something's finished. That's my only reckoning as evening yawns and stretches. If every man was here, he wasn't lonely, for his visitor came by and she stayed ages. And when they went, a book went, songs in all its spaces, a time accounted for. It's Sunday evening in a rose-lit living room, the open arms of two old chairs, grey cushions, a clock ticking. I'm off the phone with Boston, and it seems I'm going. I shall tell them I'm flying in late August. And there, I'll learn my light from dark, my right delighted scribbling hand from my poor left there listening one, and how they meet between the lines, before the weeping crest, beyond the raging fall, or words to that effect. And I'll come home a fool with a filled book, 30 years, the living and the gone may meet here too. They're here now, if you look, sir, in their shy accord. They're one to one. The sounds, the sound of heartbeats hurrying through silence. Ten years before I met Derek, he came here for the first time in 1977. And I know probably everybody in this room can almost hear him. So let's hear him. <laughs> okay. In the empty schoolyard, teacher dead today, the fruit, rotting yellow on the ground, dies from Gauguin. The pomerac dies the earth purple, the ochre roads still waiting in the sun for my shadow. Oh, so you is Walcott, you is Roddy brother, teacher Alex son. And the small rivers with important names. And the important corporal in the country station habitation looking towards the thick green slopes of cocoa the sun that melts the asphalt at noon, and the woman in the shade of the breadfruit bent over the lip of the valley. Below her, blue-green, the last, last valleys of sugar, the bus rides, the fields of bananas. The tanker still rusts in the lagoon at Roseau, and around what corner was uttered a single yellow leaf from the frangipani, a tough bark reticent, but when it flowers, delivers hard lilies, pungent, recalling Martina or Eunice or Lucilla, who comes down the steps with a cool side flow as spring water eases over shelves of rock in some green ferny hole by the hole in the mountains. Her smile like the whole country, her smell earth, red brown earth, her armpits a reaping, her arms saplings, an old woman that she is now, with other generations of daughters flowing down the steps, Jean Bitation, Belle Tifi Bitation, until their teeth go and all the rest. Oh, Martinas, Lucillas, I'm a wild golden apple that'll burst with love of you and your men. Those I never told enough with my young poet's eyes, crazy with the country, generations going, generations gone. Moi, c'est Jean Saint-Lucie, c'est là moi sorti, c'est là que j'ai born. <laughs> 